This morning we're going to be looking at the section of text from chapter, uh, from chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, and it's going to be more of a textual study. I'm going to make some comments along the way. And uh, really, the, I think the main idea of this section of text is Paul warning the Corinthian church, which we are aware of, has had some problems, right? A very problematic church, and there's some issues that Paul is trying to address. And you might remember in the beginning, in chapter 1, from the first nine verses, we talked about the idea of being called and sanctified in Christ. And the emphasis there was everything that we have is in Christ Jesus. And then verses 10 through 17, the idea of exalting human leadership. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and the temptation for us to do that today and then this uh, week we're going to be talking about exalting human wisdom. So in way of reminder, in the first nine verses, uh, we talked about, or Paul is talking about how they were called in Christ. He was a called apostle from Christ. It's not, not the will of his will. It was, it was a special calling that he had. <laughs> and what a privilege it was to be called by the God of the universe. Uh, not only a privilege for him, but a privilege for us. That he's given us a very special mission and a special purpose in life. He's taken people who were nothing and he's giving them and cleaned them up and giving them a special purpose, an ability to serve. And what a privilege and an honor. We should be excited about that. We should appreciate that. But in order to do that, he had to sanctify us. And, he, and Paul points out that it was in Christ that we were sanctified. That means made holy, but it also means set apart for a very special purpose. All grace has been given through Christ. He reminds us of that. And he specifies all grace and all knowledge. And in fact, he says that we were made rich in Christ through this grace and knowledge that we have of him. He calls us into communion. God calls us into communion of Christ, uh, the communion of his son. That's a fellowship that we share, a special privilege that we share with the king of the universe. Has given us, king of the universe has given us a privilege to have a special relationship, same status as his son, if you will, because his son, he loves his son, and he exalts us to have fellowship and call us brethren alongside with his son. And what a privilege that is. It's a communion of Christ, and we celebrate that every Lord's Day. And then he assures us that Christ is going to confirm those who confirm the testimony of Christ. And so we have an assurance that if we remain faithful in Christ, Christ is going to confirm us until the end. And so we can have assurance in that. All this is laying the groundwork for a congregation who has forgotten these things, that everything is in Christ. And we often, I said the first week that we often overlook this section and think, oh, it's just a lot of flowery goodness about Christ. Why, and we ask the question, why did he feel necessary to spend so much time on this? The Corinthians may no doubt have said, oh, I know that. And us too, we may say, oh, I know that. But the idea was they didn't know that because they had forgotten where they had come from. And then uh, verses 10 through 17, Christ wants us all to speak the same thing. You know, Paul is not just talking on his own behalf and what he wants. He says, I beseech you in the name of Christ. And that comes with the full authority of Christ and is in exercising the will of Christ because he is an apostle that was sent by Christ to straighten people out and to tell them God's message through Christ. And that happens through a unity of mind and judgment. That means we all think the same thing. That means our judgments, therefore, are going to be the same. And... What causes a problem for that is exalting human leadership. And we talked about how that can be our, our uh, problem because we want and we desire human leadership like the, like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. They wanted a king like the nations around them. And we also talked about the other side of that, which is sometimes men like power, and they exalt themselves and cause division as well. So a lot of preachers are responsible for division, and sometimes congregations are responsible because they pick the preacher that agrees with them and they start having factions and tears, and they're not speaking the same thing anymore. So this is starting off, um, we're looking primarily at verses 18 through 31, but we'd be um, neglecting something if we didn't look at verse 17. What he says in verse 17 is, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And we talked about that last week, about what that means. His emphasis wasn't on him baptizing. He didn't care who baptized. In fact, he didn't want people to think that because he baptized somebody that, that they were going to follow him. And we talked about that sometimes as a problem. We sometimes follow the preacher who baptized us. We follow the preacher who taught us the gospel. He didn't want that. But he says, and he did not preach in wisdom of word. And I'm, this is what I want to talk to as a springboard into our text today. Not in wisdom of war, word, so that the cross of Christ 
would not be made void. Your translations say may not be made empty. So what I want to point out is Paul was careful not to mix in hu human wisdom. Your translation may say, that literally the text here, and my wife said I, I didn't make it clear last week, but I, when I said I was reading from my translation, I actually took the time to translate the Greek um, into English, and so it may read a little different to you when, as I'm reading this, but technically it's wisdom of word, and your, and your translation may say cleverness of speech. He did not try to mix in human wisdom, I think is the idea, in his preaching of the gospel. He did not want to cheapen the central message of the cross by appealing to human wisdom. So he didn't preach in wisdom of word. And that would make the cross void or empty, is what he's saying. And I think the idea is it would rob the message of the cross of its power to try to appeal with human wisdom. Does that make sense? It's, it's removing the cross of its divine power when you actually start trying to appeal to human wisdom and get people to accept the message of Christ. And so wisdom of word is contrasted with the word of the cross, if you look at verse 18. So both of these ideas, there's one is a phrase called wisdom of word, and the next phrase in verse 18 is word of the cross. The, the Greek word here is logos. He's, he's, he's the message of wisdom versus the message that, of divine wisdom and the message of the cross. And they contradict each other. They're not compatible with each other. And we can't mix in human wisdom with uh, the word of the cross. So let's ask ourselves this question. How would, we make, how would wisdom or human wisdom make the cross empty? Well, it appeals to our flesh. It appeals to worldly desires. And it's watering down the gospel to appeal to those desires. And, and ultimately, human wisdom, it serves ourselves. We like a philosophy that makes us feel better. Or we, we, we read a self-help book to get to where we want to go in life, don't we? That's why we read these things, how to get rich quick or how to make a million dollars by flipping houses, you know, there's, or whatever it is. You know, we read these philosophies and we like these guys, charismatic leaders on TV that try to tell us what we want to hear to get where we want to go. Uh, worldly wisdom promises physical health. You know, if you just do this, everything will be great. Uh, worldly wisdom, you know, if you drink this and buy this pill and do this thing, you're going you're gonna to lose 50 pounds, and you're going to feel like a million bucks, and you're going to be healthy as ever. You know, that's worldly wisdom. Uh, worldly wisdom promises wealth, you know, getting rich quick if you just do this. It appeals to a limited commitment. You know, you're going to have six-pack abs and only like three minutes a day, you know, that kind of idea. You know, you're going to be wealthy in only, in only 10 minutes a month or something like that. And it promises like your best life in this world and this is literally a book titled by a famous preacher, Your Best Life Now, versus what we're looking for is an eternal life, you see. Now, the wisdom of God does provide the best way to live now, but that's not where our focus should be, is, is now. So, but I will point out that this message, if we appeal to physical health and wealth and limited commitment and everything that we want, we can draw a crowd. And that's, what, that's the idea here. That message is popular but that is robbing the, the message of the cross of its central power. And so in contrast, the cross, it requires a total commitment to Christ, not like three minute a day, you know, six pack abs, you know, just a limited commitment. It requires giving, uh, being willing to give everything to serve, like the rich young ruler and that idea, you know, being a total commitment, willing to sacrifice everything, lay down our life for Christ and whatever that may require of us. And it requires us to be sanctified or to remain holy and set apart so that we're fit for use. I gave the example several weeks ago that we had sanctified dishes in my house and sanctified bath towels that we only used when company came over. And if they were dirty and ragged out and full of holes, they weren't fit for the company to use. And so for us to be used by God, we have to remain sanctified and holy for him to use us. Now, we're not holy and sanctified on our own. But as we abide in Christ Jesus, he continually cleanses us and we remain fit for use in that idea. And so the, uh, a popular uh, sense of religion, a worldly philosophy mixed with the cross is, oh, it's not, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're still saved, you know, forever, no matter what. Uh, that kind of once saved, always saved mentality. So the cross, unfortunately, it doesn't promise health, physical health, always. Many of you here are suffering physically, so it hasn't necessarily promised you physically health. We're certainly going to die, and the older we get, the more we're going to fall apart. But it does promise us spiritual health. It doesn't, the cross doesn't promise us money. I don't know anybody here that's just loaded, but we have spiritual wealth. And it doesn't promise us fame. 
I don't know anybody here that's famous. Uh, but, you know, we are still spiritually famous, if you will. We're sons and daughters of the living God. So what is our motivation to follow Christ? If it's, if it's money and his health and his fame, then we may go away if we don't get those things that we want. And some people may follow Christ as long as things are going well in their life. If they'll pray to God if they, as long as they're getting and he's answering and blessing them materially and with their health. But once these things start going away, they may no longer follow Christ. So what's our motivation? It needs to be going back to the central message of the cross. Can you see for a moment in the Corinthian church how they may have mixed in physical wisdom, taking pride and boasting in their, in their spiritual gifts? Oh, I can speak in tongues. Oh, I can heal people and that idea. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm associated with Peter, and he was with Christ. Or I'm of Apollos, he's a great speaker. Or I follow Paul, what a great example of sacrifice. Those kind of ideas. Well, in verse 1, eight, uh, one in verse 18, uh, chapter 1, verse 118, let me read that. It says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to ones who are truly being destroyed. And again, I'm reading from the translation I made. And to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, I want to point out two things here. One is, this word of the cross is contrasted to the word of wisdom that he was carefully, careful not to mix in with his preaching. And the word of the cross is going to look foolish. Now, what is the word of the cross? It is the idea that, that the God of the universe developed a plan to save man from his sin, and he did it like this, by anointing a king and then letting him be killed anointing a savior who is going to redeem you, but he redeemed you by dying. Now, that didn't look like the scheme of redemption from the Old Testament. It was a strong military leader. God's king would come and he would clean up. He would clean house. So it looks kind of foolish on the outset that, that our redeemer, that our savior, would be somebody who would come and he would just get killed. He would let himself be killed. That's foolishness to others. Um, but notice there's, there's, there's wisdom in that. For those who are truly being saved, it is the power of God. So he's contrasting foolishness to others. It's the power of God to us because we see it for what it really is. And notice these two people, it's present tense. Uh, these people are truly being destroyed, meaning present tense, they're in the process of being destroyed. And we are, notice in your verse there, if you look, it's, it's not, it's the, we are being saved. It's the present context of that. So for somebody who says, you know, once saved, always saved, that salvation is a, a moment in time, this, this is something that is ongoing. We are being saved as we continue to believe and live faithfully in Christ Jesus. I think that's the idea that he's saying, is this is continually going on. All right, so this is just a picture, word picture to believe this. So those who are being destroyed, they say, oh, that's foolish. God would, would uh, anoint a king and then have him die on a cross. But those who are being saved say, wow. That's the power of God that he could raise a man from the dead. And I want to be raised from the dead one day, and so I'm going to believe in that. So, in verse one, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, the word of the cross, power of God. Now, I wanted to point out really quickly, there's a play on words here with power several times used in this chapter. And you can look in your Bible. In verse uh, 18, you see the power of God. The word of the cross is the power of God. Down in verse 24, it says Christ is the power of God and wisdom of God, and what we're talking about here is contrasting human power versus godly power, human wisdom versus worldly wisdom in this section of text. So Christ is that power, and he makes an appeal to the brethren. He says, you know what? Not many of us are powerful ones, so why would God choose us? So if you want to study that later, you can look at his, his use of the word power through that text. In verse 19, let me read this. He says, for it has been written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise ones, and the intelligence of the, intellig intelligence of the intelligent I will bring to nothing. So, first of all, he appeals to the fact that something has been written, meaning God has already spoken on this issue. It should not surprise you that, that God is reversing the, the, the tide in terms of human wisdom and worldly wisdom here. God has spoken this long ago. Well, what did he say? What did God say would happen? He said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now, this is quoted from a Septuagint translation of Isaiah 29, 14. It's interesting that if you look in your Bibles for 29, 14, it may not say exactly this, but if you were to look in the Septuagint translation, which was made, you know, like a couple hundred years before the time of Christ, it was a translation of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, 
translated in Alexandria into Greek, and it was the common scriptures used during the time of Jesus and the time of Paul, and so they would have been schooled in this translation. He's appealing to this translation, saying that, that God has always said that he's going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now, if you look in the context of Isaiah 29, he's talking about here shutting the minds of false prophets, you know, because a prophet is somebody that God would send information through, and now he's just going to close that off. He's not going to be speaking. He's going to confuse that. Now, everybody who's intelligent, he's just going to squeeze that off, and he's not going to be talking through them anymore. And what that does is that is the ultimate reversal of wisdom in the revelation of, the, of what the message of the cross is. Because now, look in context of what's going on. All the great Jewish scribes, all the great Jewish teachers, they never saw this coming. Everybody who is considered wise, all the Greek philosophers, they think this is stupid. All the, all the great Jewish rabbis, they're going to think this is dumb. All the priests, everybody, they don't get this great reversal of wisdom that God would reveal his plan. Even though it was laid out, and we can go back and look at it in the scriptures, they missed it because they were trying to mix in human wisdom. Uh, just as a side note, uh, Paul is going to appeal to the fact that it is written throughout this book. And you can read these, and we'll look at these as I continue to preach through the, the book of 1 Corinthians. In, in 119, 131, 29, throughout the book, he always appeals to the fact that God has written on this subject, which kind of indicates to us that his audience is perhaps familiar with the Jewish scriptures, right? If I say, hey, it is written in the Jewish scriptures, and I'm trying to make a point by that, then I would assume that you would be familiar with those scriptures. And that appeals to the authority of God's word. Now, what he just did is he quoted Isaiah 29, verse 14. But I went back and I looked at Isaiah in the context of that, and four verses earlier, in Isaiah 29, verse 10, he says that God has shut the eyes of the prophets, he shut their eyes and covered their heads. And what do they do with their eyes? You know, the idea of you hear a prophet seeing a vision, or he would dream a dream. Well, what God is doing, he's, he's, he's drying up all the visions. He's closing up all the dreams. And so all these people who are God's people that would speak for him, they're not going to understand that anymore. Why? Because they've rejected God, and they've turned to, to appeal to human wisdom over God's wisdom. And so he's just going to reject them. He's not going to listen to them anymore. And isn't that the message of the prophets in the Old Testament? God would send a prophet. They wouldn't listen to him. He says, you know, I'm going to stop sending you prophets if you don't, if you don't listen to me. And if you look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, and keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians. We're going to come back to that. Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, real quick. When Jesus is talking here, he's thanking the Father. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. And he's talking about this in context of these unrepentant cities, these people that he's gone out and he's performed miracles and signs in front of, and they've repented. I mean, they, they've not repented, you know. And, and so this, the, even Jesus is recognizing that this is the way that God works. And this, I want, the reason I went ahead and read verse 26 is because it says God was well pleased by this. It's almost like God is smiling on the fact that all these people who think that they're wise are really being made foolish because God is going to get the last laugh, so to speak. And then he just almost uh, begs the question to the crowd in verse 20. Let's look at verse 20. He says, Where is a wise one? Where is a scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made the wisdom of the world foolish? <clears throat> and so as you look around in that society, and even in ours, our best thinkers, are they telling us what's really going on? You know, you look at the CNN, you look at all the news, and you look at all the, the people and the commentators, and they're all contradicting each other. It's kind of hilarious. Uh, even the doctors, you know, sometimes they conflict themselves every like five or ten years. And all these great thinkers, it just seems like constantly, there's nothing that's solid truth. It's all, even the scientists, you know, can't, can't understand a lot about what's going on. But specifically here, he's talking about, I think, in, the, in a religious context, says, where is a wise one? Just begging the Corinthian audience, you know, find me a wise person to tell me what's really going on. Because they're all conflicting each other. Where is a scribe? Now, this means an expert in the law, somebody who is considered to be a scholar. And if you even look at uh, religious scholars today and they contradict each other, you know, where are these people and telling us what's going on? Where is a debater of this age? That's a philosopher. You know, is a philosopher going to give us the answers that we need? 
No, God's made all these people foolish, and it pleased God to do that. And uh, look at verse 121. He says, In the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God, through wisdom God was well pleased. Now, I don't know if Paul is mimicking what Jesus would have taught here, or he's, or he's looking at something previously to that, but that's the same idea that Jesus expressed in Matthew 11. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message proclaimed to save the ones who are believing. And now many times we think that we can get closer to God through our intellectual thinking. And that's what it is. He's saying that that is foolishness. We can't know God through intellectual thinking and getting closer to Him that way. God saves those who are believing in His foolishness. The world thinks that's foolishness. Have you ever gotten somewhere and you read in the scripture and you think, well, I can't, can't be. That's just silly because my intellect doesn't, tells me that that's not the way it should be. So I'm going to trust my intellect versus what the scriptures are saying. And so what we're doing, we're trusting on our own wisdom versus what the Bible says. And then we're made foolish. We have to believe in God's foolishness. So do we really understand this? You say, oh, yeah, Joe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, struggle to stay awake and listen to you, but I already got all this. But do we really understand this? Are we still trying to know God through our own intellect, through our own reasoning? And can our wisdom add anything to God's wisdom? No, it can't. So why do we still rely on our own thinking? Why don't we just blindly trust and, and step out on faith in what God is telling us to do? We have a problem with that still. And the Corinthian church had a problem with that. What we're doing is we're too quickly seeking higher things. You know, oh, I got the fundamentals down. I, I got the milk of the word down. No, you don't sometimes. You know, you think you do, but you don't. We want to go, let, give me the hard stuff. I want to ask the hard questions. I want to seek the higher things, the wisdom, and debate about these other things in the scriptures. Well, if we don't understand the fundamentals and practice those and have a simple childlike faith, then all these other things are just distractions for us. So look, let's look at what uh, the Jews, he says in verse uh, 22, he says that... Uh, the Jews are seeking for signs, and the Greeks are seeking wisdom. And sometimes that can, similar thing was going on then, similar things going on today. In Matthew uh, chapter 12, and verse 38 through 40, Jesus condemns uh, the Jews for that. It says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. The prophet and so are we looking for signs from God you know just give me a sign your words not enough you know it seems foolish I want to I want a clear sign from you God that that um, you know that's what the Jews were doing he's condemning them for that uh, in John chapter 6 and verse 30 I'm not going to read that but they were looking for signs so that they may believe Jesus and the Greeks were seeking wisdom in Acts chapter 17 you remember when uh, Paul was preaching I'll just turn over there real quick and it talks about the character of these people as a sign note. Um, Luke is, is talking about their character, what they were doing. I'll start back in verse uh, 19. And they took him, Paul, brought him into the Areopagus and saying, May we know what this teaching is which you're proclaiming? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears so that we uh, want to know what these things mean. And there's a, like a parenthetical statement here in verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing something new. Isn't that the appeal even sometimes in religion today? I want to know the deeper things. You know, I want to know the things that are controversial. Some people say ma majoring in minors. Uh, I, you know, I, I want to, and, and, and in fact, I think our, our schools of higher education, they encourage this, right? If I was to go get a doctorate in theology, I would have to come up with some original research and write a paper on that, something that had never been done before. So there's always this idea and this tendency to seek wisdom. 2 Timothy 3, 7 is condemning people like this and saying they're always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth because they seek wisdom and not the simplicity of the gospel. And he says in contrast here in verse 23, it's a simple message. We proclaim Christ has been crucified. We, we are proclaiming that a Messiah, an anointed one from God, has been crucified and he says, indeed, this is a cause for sin to the Jews. They can't understand that. And it just seems like foolishness to the nations or to the Gentiles. And so, really, that's, that's, that's true. You know? It causes some people to sin, and other people just look at it, and it seems foolish. It's a, it's a message that we're proclaiming, 
But also the implication is, is that it's a, it's a self-sacrificing life in order to follow a crucified Messiah. It's not a life of fame, it's not a life of wealth, it's not a life of all the things that the flesh wants that human wisdom appeals to. So, a pictorial representation of that. The Jews are saying, hey, where's my sign? You know, I, I want to see a sign. Uh, and some people appeal into that today. You know, I'd believe in God if he just came down from heaven right now, you know, and, oh God, if you bless me and help me win the lottery, then I know it's a sign from you and then I will, you know, follow you. Other people are just saying, oh, that's foolishness. I'm not going to listen to that. But, he says, the ones who are called, both Jews and Greeks, it's the wisdom of God and it's the power of God. It's saying, wow, God is so wise. I would have never thought of a scheme of redemption like that. So, and that's what he indicates here in verse 24. Christ crucified is the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. Even though it looks weak and foolish to others, it's wiser and stronger than any man could ever be. Verse 25, if you look at that real closely. Let me read that for you. Verse 24, and, the, and to the called ones, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So, if you were going to devise a scheme of redemption for a Messiah, if you were going to save the world with a Redeemer, and you thought, okay, I'm going to play God for a second, I'm just going to save the whole world, would you ever think to create a self-sacrificing kind of uh, situation with a Christ? I'm going to save you by a loving sacrifice. No, we would probably envision some mighty, you know, 100-foot giant to come and wipe all the wicked ones away and, and, and save all the, the good ones on the little island by themselves and, and build a paradise for them. That's what we would have probably envisioned. Not sending a, a no-name carpenter's son, not from the right family, not well-born, not wealthy, and just live a simple, perfect life and then give himself up no, we probably would not have thought about that. And then he turns in verse 26 and says, Look at your calling, brethren, because not many wise ones according to the flesh, not many are powerful ones, not many are noble ones. And the idea here is that not many brethren are wise by the world's standards. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I'm not insulting your intelligence. I'm just saying sometimes our wisdom, worldly wisdom, gets in the way of us seeing the simplicity of the gospel. So as you look around the congregation sometimes, it's not like, the, the intellectual, raw powerhouses of the world that are in there, because sometimes that can be a distraction. Not many brethren are influential or powerful. Some people are, but that's not the majority of the people who will accept the message of the gospel. <clears throat> and he says, not many are noble. That means well-born. Not many are famous. It's not like kingly leadership, you know. Now, occasionally that happens, but that's not the, the majority of the people who accept, accept it. So, why does God want us? You ever seen that, that movie, uh, it was called The Bad News Bears? It was like a baseball team of like rejects and they, they do something good. So why would God want us, who are just, they were, we're not necessarily overly wise, we're not powerful, we're not strong, many of us have health conditions, you know, we're not well-born and famous. So why does God want us? Well, look at verse 27. <coughs> he says, But God has chosen the foolish ones of the world, in order to shame the wise ones. And the weak ones of the world has chosen in order to shame the strong ones. And even the base ones of the world and the ignored ones he has chosen that the ones that are not, and, and the ones that are not, in order to bring to nothing the ones that are. So you see these three categories, the wise, the powerful, and the well-born. He's chosen the foolish to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak to shame the strong. He's chosen the ignored to shame the famous. He's turning everything upside down, and that is the wisdom of God. Now, why would God do this? Well, in verse 29, he tells us, so that no flesh may boast before God. Now, that's the kicker. We have a tendency, if I get a little money in my pocket, got a little jingle in my step, then I'm thinking, wow, I must have done something really good. You know? If I have a loaded bank account, I'm thinking, wow, look at what I did for myself. I really made things happen for myself. See how that can be a distraction from God. You know, if I'm, if I'm really strong and powerful and I can, you know, I'm in an influential position, you know, they say absolute power corrupts absolutely, that idea. 
well, I, I'm boasting. You know, look how powerful I am. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He surveyed all his kingdom and think, look what I did for myself. And, and somebody who's well-born, you know, they, could, they think, well, I'm a king. You know, I, I'm, I'm from, descended from, you know, so-and-so, and so I'm special. So that's, these are all causes to boast. But they're not boasting in what they need to be boasting about. They're boasting in things that they have really no control over because all these things came from God. So that's why, in God's ultimate wisdom, he chooses the foolish to shame the wise. He chooses the weak to shame the strong. He chooses the ignored to shame the famous. And um, in, verses one, in verse 31, if you'll skip down there, and I'll come back to the ones I missed, he says, It has been written that the one who boasts is to boast in the Lord. And this is a reference from Jeremiah, if you'll turn with me there, Jeremiah chapter 9. In verse 23, <clears throat> Jeremiah verses 9, verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So we don't boast in the things that God has granted us. We boast, if we're going to boast in anything, the fact that we know him, the fact that we have a relationship with him. And I believe that is why the message of the gospel is so easily accepted by those people who do not have these things. They're not blinded by wealth. They're not blinded by power because they're physically sick or have, they're weak otherwise from the world's standards. They're not wise in the ways of the world. They're not well-born, and so they're well more acceptable to the message of the cross. Um, let's go back and look, and look at verse 30. And from him you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom to you from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Um, the idea in, in uh, Greek here is sometimes it says, when we use the word both, we compare two things to each other. But in Greek, they'll just say both, and they'll list a whole list of things. So we have all these things from Christ. That is the wisdom of God we have. And the idea is it's from Him that we're in Christ Jesus. So if we're going to boast of anything, we need to boast of this privilege we have from God that we are in Christ. And from God, Christ has become wisdom to us. At the, early in the chapter, he says that we've, He's given us all grace, and that was through all knowledge and all wisdom. He's blessed us with all these things. And he, he, he basically, I think he's qualifying what this is, what this wisdom delivers to us. It's righteousness. That means we're made right. We were not right. We were sinful. But God has made us in a right relationship with him. We were not fit for use, unholy. But now we've been made holy and fit for use. We were enslaved to sin. Couldn't even get out of sin if we wanted to. But Christ has redeemed us and paid a, paid a ransom price and delivered us from that. So we have all this stuff. We've been redeemed out of sin. We've been set up and put on a pedestal, if you will, to set apart for use and made clean and holy. And we're right in his eyes. And so that's the end of uh, the chapter one. And we'll be continuing that series as, as time permits going forward. But I want to extend that invitation to you uh, this morning, as I've done in the past, is... <coughs> We need to remember that we get all these things from Christ Jesus, from God. This is laying the foundation and the groundwork to deliver a message, an important message to a church that has division and has problems in it. And every church has problems. And so what we've done is we've laid the foundation here, and Paul's laid the foundation uh, more specifically, for a church that has a lot of problems. And if they can get this down, then they'll accept the rest of what he's going to say. Uh, because everything is, needs to be refocused and resettered on Christ. That's where our righteousness comes from. That's where our redemption from sin comes from. That's, we need to uh, accept and appreciate the fact that we're set apart for a special service. And I use the example that if, uh, if a king called you up and said, you know, Jeremy, I have a very special mission for you, and you accepted that mission, you'd be like, oh boy, the king called me, and I have a special mission. This is important. And you would feel, you would boast in the king that he called you in to do that. And that's the idea. We need to boast in the Lord that he has set us apart for a special work. So if we're here this morning and we haven't been set apart for a work, if we're not fit for service, and you probably know if you're fit for service or not, if you're not fit for service, you need to get fit for service. 
If you haven't been redeemed from your sin, you're still struggling in sin, come to Christ for redemption. Come to Christ for sanctification so you can be set apart and made, made whole so that you can be uh, worthy of that good work. So you can be right and just in the eyes of God. If anyone's subject to that invitation this morning, we ask you to come as we sing the appointed song.